take two. Okay. Hi everyone, my name is Lahiru and uh, yes, yeah, I'm really um, glad to be presenting this at the end of the, end of the day because uh, I'm sure you guys have been through lots of really exciting information and I just want to add to that. So look, the introduction, look, um, yeah, <laughs> uh, thanks for having me here. Um, a bit about me. Uh, look, the stuff I, I want to go through really is a lot of exam technique stuff that really anchored into real situations that you might encounter in this exam. Um, and again, I just want to make, I, I find that this exam is a bit of a puzzle. And uh, th I, I feel like these are the techniques that I found really, really helped me to make this uh, this whole exam experience go, go a lot smoother. So, you know, essentially you're just trying to mind read a bit of what the examiners expect and then communicate your answers in a really, really good fashion. And I think there's a lot of things that you know, you know when you when you when you when you've learned from other fanskers who've done the exam. There's a lot of things that go well for you, and I think if you haven't had that experience, these are the techniques, or if maybe you, you, it's not it's kind of new to you. These are the techniques that I think will make you sound uh, sharp and clear with more impact. Um, now, with, with all of this stuff, I found that a lot of this stuff really helped me not just in the exam, but also in real life. So hopefully, you'll kind of you you kind of get that from this presentation as well. Uh, so a lot of the stuff, what, what I'm going to go through is a lot of the techniques that I do in the Viva Bootcamp. So this is an exam course that I run for the part two exam. There's two sessions, uh, one kind of basic, basic stuff and lots of drills, and then a second more advanced session with more clinical examples and exam practice as well. And then I've got a final exam online uh, prep course that's purely online as well. Uh, so those are just those two things there. Um, so really, I'm, this is going to be like a bit of a taste. So I'll definitely go through some of the techniques that I think have been most valuable and the themes that are most valuable for passing this exam. Um, I've got a, also got an exam course for IMGs, and that's at this link over here. Um, hey, I mean, just to, just to get the ball rolling, um, is there anything about this exam, anything that, you know, consultants have contradicted each other on or you've heard from examiners? about this exam that you just wanted to raise. I'd really like it if someone, yeah, just offered any, anything at all. Oh, hello, can you hear me? Yeah, go for it. Oh, hi, it's Annabelle up from Newcastle. Yeah, um, one of the things the other day we were talking about is um, structures, particularly short answer questions. So some people say like, to like your pre-intra post-op or your patient surgical anesthetic factors and then other times they'll say why do people keep doing this it doesn't fit doesn't work mm -hmm. kind of just feels like you still have to read their mind sometimes I'm not sure if you've got any insight yeah absolutely or, um, <laughs> so input into that yeah thanks I think that's a really great question and a lot of the time it puzzled me when I go through examiner's reports um whether it's the first part or the second part there's always some level of contradiction or a uh, you know, a problem with expectations. And I think the problem is that it's essentially they're asking broad questions with many, many different approaches and medicine and anesthesia isn't standardized. And so when we put answers on the page that are, could be completely, you know, reasonable and correct, uh, depending on the examiner at the time, they may feel like they see it a different way. And I don't think the exam has gone a long way to standardizing it. It's not like they ask, you know, what is the, what are the three causes of this or what is the you know, number one first line evidence-based treatment for this. It's not like they're asking those things. They're asking a very general question with a lot of broadness to it. And so what I'd say to that, the, the first thing I'd say is that, uh, the, the, the first obvious thing is that if there's a question to be answered, you answer it absolutely directly. Often there'll be a broad framework that's required and broad frameworks are required for broad questions. And the whole pre, intra, post-op or anesthetic surgical patient, there'll be, beneficial to different questions. Uh, so what I'd say is that, you know, when, when I did this exam from day one, it was all about active learning. It was all about, you know, doing lots and lots of short answer questions, you know, uh, like literally, literally, you know, five times a week, me and my study mate, we would be doing these short answer questions and realizing that some questions just belong to one structure and other questions belong to another structure. And really it just takes practice to do that. And it's very hard to, do it on the fly on the day so essentially back when i was doing this people said don't study don't practice saqs it's not worth it just study for the mcqs and study your notes because they don't repeat saqs that's obviously not exactly true they repeat lots of saqs in very in different formats and slightly different ways and it's only through that practice and making sure that you, you know you've got your you know writing technique down your listing down your right handwriting is good all these other things that allows you to pass that so answer the question, uh, use the structure that's valuable for or, you know, most appropriate for that question. 
And the final thing is just being able to put lots of facts on the page. So if, if, I, if I targeted answering the question and a good structure so I didn't miss any points and making sure that I had lots of good data on the page, I, I, my, my theory was that no matter how different the opinion of the examiner might be, it would be hard for them to fail me because I've just got lots of data on the page that they couldn't contradict, you know, lots of true statements, um, if there's evidence to be shown, good evidence, and decisions being made. Uh, and that, I mean, that's, that's the way I've gone about it because, again, I can't mind read the examiner. I've just got to play the game as best as I can. And, you know, it, I'm not an examiner. I've observed the exam. I've sat the exam. I've spent a lot of time thinking about the exam. But then you do an SAQ mark by someone else, and I may disagree with it. Two examiners might disagree with it. And really, it's because of the nature of the exam. Uh, so I hope I, that, that wasn't probably the most direct answer to the question, but that was my approach, knowing that there's probably no real great method of mind reading the examiners. Did that, did that answer your question or was there any follow up? Yeah, no, that's good. Thanks. Um, at any stage, we'll keep this really informal, so please feel free to ask any questions at any time. Um, all of my part to final exam resources are on my YouTube channel. Um, and I've got lots of stuff there. So there's a playlist. Uh, I think it's called final exam playlist or, uh, or part two exam playlist. Uh, and all the courses that I'll put up are on here. Um, uh, yeah, so that's that. And look, I, I usually say video on and mic off, but right now I'm in a place called Broom where the internet connectivity is just terrible. So I'm totally okay with you not having your videos on. And if I do, if, if my connection does get a bit, a bit bad, I'll turn my video off and then I'll try to hotspot. So I've got a bit of a plan in place, but I'm so sorry if this all cuts out because that has happened once before. So the goals from this session, I wanna give you as many tips as I can for the exam. I wanna go through really useful structures. So there's always something there that you can put you know, answers to and highlight critical issues and then viva stems and then how to approach difficult decisions. So I go through the critical issues as the main theme of my course through many, through, you know, we go through, you know, cumulative, four hours on one day, four hours on the other day. The Viva Stems is one of those lectures we'll go through and difficult, difficult decisions. So uh, we'll go through a taster of these things. Now, basic assumption, uh, I'm sure you've heard me say this, if you've ever heard this many, many times where I'll, I'll hopefully ask you lots, a few questions, lots of questions, and I don't care if you get the answer right or wrong. It's just about, you know, making, putting answers out there and getting better for this exam. And also, you know, this exam, I found it one of the hardest things that I've this was one of the hardest things I've ever had to go through. And that's probably just a, just a uh, you know, really good sign that I'm, you know, life is pretty good for all of us. Uh, but yeah, just remember it is tough and you'll, you'll have a lot of challenges with this, talk to someone, but just remember to put it into perspective that no matter what happens with this exam, if you fail this five times and never get to end state training, you're probably still one of the smartest, most successful people uh, on this earth ever. So why is exam, exam challenging? Look, I think all of us have done the grueling primary exam. We relaxed for you know one to two years. We've got so many different consultant supervisors, um, so many different hospitals that we work at, and many different approaches and opinions. And so, as soon as you get this a new situation that's you know exam standard, where everything's a little bit complex, so lots of issues, it's going to be challenging, especially because you've had so many opinions. And part of this exam is just learning how to make a really good decision that's robust, in amongst all the other things that might be going. Getting, um, you know, going on. Yeah, just a bit of audio feedback there. I'm not quite sure what's there. I will just ask now, has that changed at all or is it still there? Still there, yeah. Okay. Oh, that's better. Yep. Oh, th th is this better now? Yes, that's much better. Ah, because... Um... Does, how does this sound right now? Yeah, it sounds good. At least that that, that buzzing's gone. <laughs> Beautiful. Perfect. Okay. I think it's just my little uh, connect lab, lab mic there. Good. So as I was mentioning, with all of these different variables in place, as soon as you get a really tough situation, you you know it's hard to really know what the right thing to do because a lot of the time in your training, you've been kind of told what to do and you're not really making decisions by yourself. So there's a big part of this exam is absolutely being able to make decisions and back yourself. So the Viva exam, you know, eight Vivas, 15 minutes each, and it's discussion of a case scenario with the examiner. And you know, straight from the exam, it, the aim is to create a realistic patient scenario that evolves, progresses, 
and test the candidate's abilities at multiple points in this timeline. So, you know, as much as I'll go through a lot of these structures and how to frame things, you know, when you're actually in the vibe, just remember that you might get a few words out and then the examiner will move straight on. Like, you know, you say one thing, they'll question it. You, you say something that's accurate or whatever, boom, you move on to the next thing. You, you know, you, you offer one as assumption and they change the assumption. So just remember, you be prepared. This is that, that movement of things that feels like you're constantly being grilled and challenged is exactly how you should probably feel that they'll, you know, often be not that much time for you to say some massive spiel that you've prepared. That said, I think it's really valuable to have these frameworks and structures because how else do you reproduce what you're going to say each time without, without these structures? Uh, yep, so this is exactly what it says. Um, application of safe clinical practice, sound clinical judgment, prioritize clinical actions, demonstrate ability to change, adapt to changing clinical scenarios, be able to justify your clinical decisions and demonstrate situational awareness and the ability to work in and lead team environments. Cool. And so, uh, you know, over, so I've been doing kind of this Viva exam teaching since about 2014. So I've spoken to many examiners over that time, being an observer in this exam. And I thought I'd just share with you, you know, what I've come up with uh, be because of that experience. So, you know, every job has so many repetitive elements and occasionally you'll just notice some very, you know, important issue. And it's usually based on the whole situation, the patient, the procedure, pathology, the procedure list, the surgeon, the place and personnel. Um, and by now, now that you've you know, been doing anesthetics for you know, three, four, five years or so, you'll notice a lot of these critical issues. And I would argue that this, these points are the most important things to direct your attention to in this, in, in this fiber and possibly in real life as well. And you know, the fact is that these, the examiners really do wanna hear these critical issues at the expense of a lot of the other stuff. So they're regularly looking to hear these critical issues. And, and that's just from my observation of being in the exam as an observer and directly asking the examiners, hey, you know, what, did you want to just hear the money? Did you just want them to say the answer? And they will, you know, almost invariably say, say yes to that. This is never officially mentioned, which I, I find is a, it's a bit of a problem, but probably realistic. It's hard to say that we want you to pick what we think is a, what you think is a critical issue and gamble on that. So it's never officially mentioned. Also, just know that hearing the same spiel time and time again cannot really differentiate between the candidates. So, um, you know, if, if, if you were to ask about an ALS situation, the fact that everyone runs through doctors A, B, C, D really doesn't differentiate. It probably, we, you know, weeds out the really poor candidates, but, you know, it doesn't really test anyone else because that's such base level knowledge. If your critical issues gambit, gambit is not enough, you can always fall back to a categorized system. So I don't think there's much risk in saying that this is what I think is most important or this is what I think the answer is. Yeah, so that's, that's something that, you know, ab absolutely time and time again, examiners will tell me this and is what I observed. By the way, feel, I'm, I'm obviously going at a bit of a pace, um, but feel free to jump in and clarify and ask any questions at, at the end of each of these slides. Now, one of the interesting things about this exam is I feel like over time, there's definitely been varying uh, expert opinion judgments by the examiners. So very occasionally I've seen and heard examiners have an opinion about the correct management based on kind of the local Australian practice rather than evidence itself. And this kind of makes it difficult to know ahead of time exactly, you know, what, what the right answer is. Um, but the first thing, this isn't common, you know, most of the stuff we do, I think most of these this really would agree on, uh, you know, a certain spectrum of, of, of management plans. But you know, there's a few things I've heard over time. So, you know, rapid sequence induction in epigotitis was just, just not the way of doing things yet. There's many case series of that being completely fine or an IV induction in tamponade. Again, you know, most people would say you want to do an inhalational induction to um, avoid uh, uh, dropping, the, the, you know, to avoid PP, avoid dropping preload uh, and causing an arrest in this patient. But the most recent exam that I observed, there was a situation of a traumatic tamponade, right? And, um, all the candidates said, look, I'd do a partial drainage and then facilitate the induction for the correction of the tamponade. And the, and the examiner just wasn't happy. I remember asking them, oh, well, you know, why, why, why didn't you think that was the right thing to do? And they, they said, that, look, as a group of examiners, we decided that, you know, a traumatic tamponade, there'd be no real benefit in draining it um, before induction because it just reaccumulated. And that didn't make perfect sense to me. Maybe, maybe there's something, some evidence that I'm not aware of um, that it just reaccumulates so quickly, there wouldn't be a benefit. But I, I didn't quite understand how they came to that opinion, uh, and it wasn't, you know, it wasn't the right answer in this in this 
very specific situation. So, you know, being, being aware of this is important. And that's, that's why you really just want to have lots and lots of exam practice on, on, on the board before you get to this, to this exam, because there'll be times when you will think that you need to do the right thing, but the exam will throw a curveball. For example, imagine that situation where you, where you think that, you know, you need to do something outside of protocol or outside the normal plan. You can be aware of this and frame your answer by saying, look, this is, this is probably not the, you know, the traditional method of doing something. I'm aware that this is not the traditional method, but I think based on the situation, the risk is high if I do this, therefore I'm going to do something a bit you know, left of center. Now, obviously exam the examiners, they're human, they hear the same things over and over again. Uh, and examining, you know, it's difficult and the day is long and you need to manage the examiner as well. I think there's plenty of times where I've just been talking and just, you know, just regurgitating so much information that, you know, you, you can see that they're focused on ticking stuff. They're not hearing absolutely everything. So I often vary phrasing, tone, body language and gestures. If I need to make a really important point, then I'll, you know, make eye contact and make sure that this, they know that this is the answer to my question after I've done a little spiel uh, framing the situation. Also emphasizing critical points so that you know that they've you know, done that eye contact, as I mentioned. Uh, and you know, after maybe uh, you know, saying a few words, you'd say, most importantly, this is what I would do and vary that phrasing. And again, every time you receive an exam, try, being, try taking that exam and being examined to your colleagues because you see how difficult it can be. And you know, examiners will have you know, their own abilities to take in information. Um, that's not, you know, that's not absolutely perfect. So yeah, Vivit to test clinical judgment, decision-making and conflicting, conflicting prioritization. And so with decision-making, you know, it's more difficult if there isn't a well-known guideline or method. So you know, I remember one examiner telling me how they, they will not necessarily make a patient arrest every time because of a small drop in blood pressure, that's peri-arrest, takes far more decision-making than an arrest because it just becomes a flow chart. So a lot of this exam you'll notice, and I'll hopefully go through some of these things where you know, you, you'll think it's just a normal situation, but then it's, it, there's something slightly off the normal protocols and you, need to, and you need to address that. When two decisions could result in a bad outcome, you'll be conflicted and a suboptimal decision needs to be made. And you know, I just think creating difficult decisions in your virus to get comfortable is absolutely paramount. So imagine you know, asking some basic thing about you know, how would you do in wave fiber optic? And then just say, well, how about patients allergic to all local anesthetics? And, and, and that was actually one of the Viva questions of the year before, me, year, year before me. You know, you can create these difficult decisions to get comfortable with trying to move outside of what, uh, what you'd normally do. I want to show you this general marking guide. Um, now, I just want to draw your attention that first of all, it's this marking guide isn't that rigorous, you know, everything is pretty subjective. There's not too much, you know, e each point there uh, has different variables that they're talking about. And if I draw your attention to the fail marks, again, it's very, it seems just pretty subjective. Hey, is everyone able to hear me okay? Okay, cool. Hopefully just one, one person, not a, Everyone's? Yep, feeling everything okay coming through. Beautiful. Um, so as you can see, yeah, everything here is has a reasonable level of sub subjectivity. It's not like they wait for you to hear an absolute a word and then they're marking it off. So what I take from this, as this, this is the marking guide, this is the game we're playing. A lot of this exam is about giving confidence that you are you know, a good candidate that deserves to pass. I mean, obviously you'll have to make correct decisions and do right the correct things. But at the end of the day, you need, you know, you need to be saying things in a certain way. And that's hopefully what the exam technique will, will get you. So now what I thought I'd go through is just how to answer the question. This is kind of my theory of how you'll get questions in the Viva. Uh, and based on that, how you, can, how you can change this up a bit. So if you imagine this situation, um, what complications will you discuss in your preoperative consultation? Um, now, this is, you know, obviously a really, you know, reasonably broad question. Um, you know, you'd think, you know, just answer the question, right? 
But when you record yourself, I want you to see how long it takes you to get the answer right. And it, you know, it might surprise you that it takes quite a long time to get to that point. Now, so that's a general question, but some questions are very specific. For example, what is neuropathic pain or what is the valve area of severe stenosis? These are easy. You, you know, either you don't, you know, it's testing knowledge directly. You either know the answer or you don't know the answer. The most questions like that previous one will be general. Um, especially, you know, the first stem in your viva, like we saw. So the first stem in your viva is often broad. Um, so what information do you need? How do you assess this patient? How do you perform this induction? What are the issues? They're really general. And I thought we'd go through a bit of an exercise about, you know, just the viva stems. So, you know, crisis happens, what do you do? Or describe comment on this ECG, chest X-ray, ABG. So this requires a large range of facts. And this is much more difficult and requires a robust structure and, you know, distilling those critical issues. Now, so how I would say to approach general questions, you could either give a complete categorized answer, you know, very primary exam style, or you could attempt to find the critical issue. So what do I mean by this? You know, I'll, so I'll use these examples. So imagine you've got uh, an you know, assessment of a patient with a large, large thyroid mass, a deteriorating patient with hypotension, temperature 42, or a prolonged wound, or hypoxemia on induction of a patient with COPD, or maybe ECG with rapid AF. Now, categories answers would include, you know, my full assessment includes, you know, I would, so my full assessment of that thyroid patient would include da, da 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 and you'd say your whole assessment, not really addressing any points of difference. Or the, the other one about the septic patient, I would do an ADV approach, stabilize the deteriorating, this, this deteriorating patient, cause of hypoxemia R, and list them. Uh, or the ECG and start going through your method for reporting an ECG. So categorize that, so I do think they need structure. Um, so you can create a, you know, a known category or make your own, but give the headings first so that you get through everything as quickly as possible. So for example, this may not be required if the headings are well known. For example, in an A2 assessment, you know, people know what you're gonna say after you say, look, I'd check the airway, I'd look and listen for any problems with the airway and then manage it this way. As you're going through, you don't necessarily need to say the whole structure because that's just, you know, that's just using extra words and cliches when you can just go ahead with the answer. Similarly, I'll do this assessment by, on history, I'd take, you know, I'd ask these questions. On examination, I'd look for this, et cetera, et cetera. But, but it is necessary if you create a unique category for the situation. So if you get asked something about what may cause hyperkalemia in this patient, you know, you, it would be worthwhile to, you know, ask about your category, you know, you know, there's too much ingestion or redistribution or lack of output. You could, you know, it's not such a well-known category, therefore you'd, you'd state what it is. And then you start giving the detail. So this way you show the examiner your complete answer without going into potentially unnecessary detail on just one point. You know, like imagine in the hyperclinic situation, you just went to all the causes of you know one aspect of it and just went down that road, then you would have, you know, by giving the structure, you allow the examiner to probe into the part of that that they want to or they think is relevant for this patient. So again, I do think these categories are it's a it's a really effective method. You get lots of information out in a pretty concise way, prevents you talking about one issue too long, gives a range of topics for the examiner to focus on. And, you know, you just cover a lot of range of points and marks rapidly and allows the examiner to progress you quickly. But, you know, the, the way I think you should actually approach this is a combined method. So you would want to attempt to find that critical issue first. So being, you know, that critical issue means finding and stating the reason, reason that makes this scenario so different to normal. So what is likely to be the major discriminating factor in this situation? So, you know, assessment of a patient with a large thyroid mass, and let, well, let's go through these scenarios now. So on assessment, I'm particularly concerned about the large thyroid mass and causing and it's causing um, cardiac respiratory compromise. The fact that they need to be euthyroid before the, before the procedure and is it a malignant lesion? So I'm not saying anything about the rest of the assessment. I'm just going straight for the money. The deterioration is most likely due to septic shock. So I'll manage as per surviving sepsis guidelines. And then, you know, you essentially fluid restarts, vasopressor, early antibiotics, et cetera. With hypoxemia, there's most likely due to bronchospasm in the context of COPD and intubation. But serious causes to rule out include pneumothorax, endobronchial intubation, sputum plugging. 
The ECG is very concerning for rapid AF. I'll check hemolytic stability and manage. So to the point of this whole talk, so how do I know which style to use? You can't really mind read the examiners. So I combine both depending on the question. And this method really is to get to an answer quickly and then give a complete framework if it's required. For example, if I use both strategies, in addition to my usual assessment, so they know that you're going to talk about everything else, I'll then go through what I'm really most concerned about. The deterioration most likely to use septic shock. And I do those things that I mentioned, pause, and then in more detail, my ADE approach includes whatever things that you, you, need, to, you need to mention in your doctor's ABCDE approach. The hypoxemia is most likely due to the bronchospasm, as we mentioned before, but I'll also take the lungs, confirm, hand, ventilate, and manage with however you want to manage that problem of hypoxemia, and they'll offer you solutions and findings. And then my categorized range of causes includes, you know, decreased FiO2, VQ mismatch, shunt, diffusion abnormality, and hyperventilation. So the ECG is very concerning for rapid AF. I'll check hemodynamic stability and manage. And would you like to read, me to read the ECG in more detail? So look, my summary of the way, again, I approach these really broad questions is to just highlight that critical issue and then go back to the, cat the categories if, if, I'm, if I'm required to do so. And if you utilize both, you just get to the a faster answer and demonstrate your cl clinical acumen as well because you know the context and what, what is most important. Yeah, so really the aim of these, my course is really this speaking out loud, finding the critical issues, utilizing your structures and covering a range of situations in the exam. Um, yeah, so repeat intentional practice, self-evaluate. Hey, so what I thought we'd go through is just some intro STEM activity. So now I really want you guys to get involved and um, write down answers uh, when, you're, when you're at home or in the theater. And then I'll just ask someone as a volunteer. Uh, so the aim, we wanna use your time wisely, tackle broad questions systematically and precisely and utilize each part of the STEM. So nothing, you know, the big hint is nothing in the STEM is accidental. Uh, I hope you guys, after you do your written, definitely go through these Viva STEMs because it, it, it's just so peculiar, some of the things that they say. So Viva STEMs, I want you to blow them away with a great first impression. Let's practice for 90 seconds because realistically there's a bit of a change over time. So you don't get the full two minutes. Use fluid structures and each STEM, you know, requires only slight changes to that. So, you know, Look, 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 for these 90 second Viva stems, let's analyze some real ANSCA Viva stems. We'll take 90 seconds to write down some notes and formulate an answer, and then someone shares their answer. And then I'll just go through my approach. And again, just know that this is just my opinion about how I'd approach it um, in, the real, in the exam. Who knows how quickly they'll move on, but at least you want a robust way that's prepared and just you know, reproducible for this, this kind of stuff. Now, just in terms of the structures that I've used in this before we go on, like, you know, if, if you, you get your own methods of doing various structures, completely go for that. So for overall situations, you know, like the, how would you approach when, uh, you know, a whole context of situations, I use the patient pathology procedure personnel and uh, place kind of thing, which is just an extension of anesthetic, surgical and um, patient factors. If it's assessments, the sick patient is doctor's ABCD. If they're well, it's history, examination, investigations. If it's a disease state, I, I, I wanna check severity and stability as well as what caused the disease, any complications I'd expect, and then treatments and problems from the treatments. And then within all of that, I can always add on to kind of supersize this with adding a professional document or protocol or policy, adding a critical issue or stating the overall problem. And then if they've written something a bit interesting, I will acknowledge that and, and make sure the, that, I've, that I've mentioned that. So let's get started. Um, so I want you, everyone to have a read of this and take notes. So take about 90 seconds and I'll just get a volunteer to answer the question, how would you assess his volume status for anesthetic intervention prior to uh, imaging? So yeah, take, um, take about 90 seconds now and I'll just ask for a volunteer. Okay, so that's about 90 seconds. Um, and again, safe place, just use this as an opportunity to get, get out an answer. <laughs> and um, yeah, uh, does anyone want to volunteer? Um, I'm happy to volunteer. So this is Lara from Zoom. Hey, Lara from Zoom. Perfect. Hey, um, so believe it or not, we oh. actually sort of ran. 
We sort Sorry, of actually ran through we ran through this question one of, with someone else earlier today, oh, um, unfortunately. But um, can I, can I, I just ask done? you before yeah. you crack on? How did you organise your answer just to kind of signpost it for everyone listening? Sure. So I probably didn't organise it. Um, it was kind of more in the context of assessing whether this patient um, needs urgent intervention or not. But I guess you could talk about you could talk about it in terms of like clinical potentially clinical signs and symptoms, yep. um, uh, or maybe symptoms, signs, mechanisms of action, um, and as in uh, for, vo for, for volume status. How would you assess volume yeah, status? Yeah, yeah, or um, potentially investigations. What you're getting back on those in initial bedside bloods and your gas. Beautiful. That's, so, so that um, sounds like a history examination investigation kind of format. Yes. Beautiful. Cool. Okay, go for it. So I guess in, uh, with clinical signs and symptoms. So symptoms, you have an anxious patient um, and then sign potentially that, again, increases your risk of having a um, increased sword loss. Mm -hmm. You're looking at your vital signs and your conscious state. So your heart rate, your blood pressure, um, again, the conscious state, diaphoresis, cap refill. Um, and you're looking if this patient has an increased, uh, so a relatively young patient, 47, has an increased heart rate, but has decreased blood pressure, decreased conscious state, is diaphoretic. They probably have at least stage four shock. So you're thinking they've got at least, they've lost at least 40% um, of their blood volume um, as an initial. And cap refill comes into that too. Um, but then this case is probably a little bit muddied by the fact that the patient takes amphetamines and is also beta blocked. Um, so you've got to take that into consideration with his assessment. So while these OBS might look initially quite normal, they're probably largely not normal in this patient. Um, similarly, um, if you've, um, the nature of the wound itself, so the fact he's got an abdominal gunshot wound and it looks like there isn't significant injuries externally, given the nature of the mechanism, it's highly likely that there's insignificant internal damage. Um, and going along with that, you could take some baseline gases before you're sending them off to, to radiology if you think they're stable enough. Um, so looking at the lactate, looking at the HB, looking at the base axis to see um, what their degree of um, hypervolemia is. Yeah, fantastic. There's a lot of really good, great things I like about your answer. Um, now, I've, I've chucked in primary survey there, but I, I, don't, I don't think you really need it. And if you were to say, look, I do an ADU assessment, great, but you want to move on to the, to the main, main stuff. Um, so I've, I've done very similar things. After primary survey to stabilize, stabilize this trauma patient, I do a focus history examination investigation to assess volume status in the, cult of, in the context of multiple distractors. I've kind of put out that thing which you mentioned, which is the fact that you've got all of this stuff happening, but there's some really peculiar, big peculiarities about what's going on with this patient. Um, and really, really glad that you mentioned it, which is, as you mentioned, the beta blockade, meth use, potentially non-compliant, difficult history I've added as well. Uh, and then really the rest of it, I think it's fair to say that most of us would, if we were to ask all of us what the assessment, we, we, you know, there'd be a lot of commonalities, but there's, there'd be a lot of things that we would have said differently to others. But, you know, I think you mentioned all of the ones I would have mentioned as, as really important points. For example, you know, just the gunshot, the mechanism, time of injury, visible blood, then all the kind of diaphoretic stuff, agitation, uh, the clinical signs, then the examination findings and vital signs and investigations, fast scan, bloods, and TT, knowing that the ejection fraction would probably be a confounder with this patient as well. But yeah, so good. You know, having having a good structure, you can just not feel as, as intimidated by really complex situations because you always just fall back on this very robust structure that you've known for decades. Let's go for this one. Uh, so again, take 90 seconds. Um, what will you do when you arrive in the emergency department? And again, I'll get a volunteer after about 90 seconds. And same thing, I'll ask you what your structure is and then get your answer. Okay, so that's about 90 seconds there. Yeah, does anyone want to volunteer their answer? Um, yeah, I'll do it. Um, so... Yeah, uh, how, 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 did, you, how did you organise your answer to start with? Sure, so with this, do you mind just going back just so I can look at of things course. as well at the same time? Thanks, otherwise <laughs> I forget. Um, and so with this one, I've said this is a patient who presents um, presumably oh, during... What's your, your organisation first? Uh, oh, sorry, organisation. So I've done it as a doctor's ABCDE to facilitate rapid transfer to um, presumably clot retrieval. Okay, cool. Go for your answer. 
Uh, so I've just said there's a patient presents most likely during work, patient presenting during work hours with an acute um, uh, stroke um, who uh, is compliant with instructions and therefore most likely suitable for sedation. Um, I would approach this patient as a with the doctor's A, B, C, D, E approach, whilst also facilitating um, rapid, um, I guess, assessment and mobilisation of um, theatre resources um, to proceed this case as soon as possible. Um, and I would consent, take bloods, um, perform NIS or get someone to do the NIS, um, link in resources um, and basically proceed as per my um, hospital's guidelines. With this with this patient and not interrupt um, rapid patient flow nor um, I guess um, giving of uh, thrombolytics or other medications. Yeah, great. Is, 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 is there anything uh, you, know, you know that whole um, something strange about this situation? Is there anything a bit weird about this situation that you could highlight as well? Um, are you talking about the atrial fibrillation, or are you talking about the the flozen, or yeah, maybe maybe with the atrial fibrillation, is it a bit, something a bit unexpected potentially? Uh, so uh, I miss something. Here. Um, no, no, that's right. It's no, not I'd, that. I'd just say I'd, I'd stabilize the patient again as per um, usual sort of primary into a secondary survey, mm -hmm. um, and then proceed. But you you should be obviously stabilizing rate control and making sure that um, yes yes that they're okay prior to going to theatre. Absolutely. Hey, so this this isn't necessarily a big overall approach thing, uh, but then because I said, what what did you do when you arrived there? I was thinking, oh look, the, you know, there's so many things that I do in this in, the, in this remote setting. So I've kind of used the the five P's approach, the so, you know procedure, personal place, patient pathology, and that way I can kind of cover as many things. Um, and that doesn't take away anything from your answer because your answer is really good. Uh, so I'd clarify the situation environment, you know, stroke call, other teams are present. So that's kind of the personnel type thing. After a primary survey to stabilize this patient, I'd then do my usual ass assessment, but a detailed assessment of comorbidities. And, and I love what you said, you know, essentially this is, this is really just a stroke assessment, you know, function and suitability of clot retrieval. And I really like that you, you did say then you wouldn't interrupt the flow of getting this patient managed because that really is where this patient is saved. Um, and then... The, the, you know, the thing, you know, I, I, don't, I don't expect to mind read the examiners. If I was to go through the um, type 2 diabetes situation, I'd be able to just, re, you know, just kind of uh, regurgitate all the things I'd want to know about type, uh, type 2 diabetic patients. And then the AF, which was, you know, highly likely to be the cause of the stroke, uh, which would be unusual when the patient was anticoagulated. So maybe there's something else going on. Maybe that was part of this viva, I'm not sure. Um, and that's, that, that was the thing I was alluding to. Why, why would they have a stroke when they anticoagulated with tabagatrin? Were there any other factors? Hmm. I just, um, I just had a look at the endovascular clot re retrieval pathway. Uh, and this is from New South Wales, I believe. Uh, and it, it was just interesting because, I, you know, when, when I went through my exam, clot retrieval wasn't much of a thing, especially in the hospital I, I was at. Uh, and so it's, you know, it really is interesting to know, uh, you know, just the, the kind of points of difference of what I really need to know to see if they're suitable. And that's potentially something that can, can be asked. That's a bit outside of our specialty level, but pretty impressive if you, if you know a few things like, you know, six hours is a time frame. Uh, you know, the independent function, uh, stroke physician review on site, which is reasonable and neurological deficit present in, in which case, yes, endovascular clot, clot retrieval. Okay, final case. Um, so yeah, how would you assess his perioperative risk of both morbidity and mortality? Again, a really broad question. Uh, take 90 seconds. And how would you answer this? I'll just get a volunteer again. Um, so that's about 90 seconds. And it's just amazing. Like obviously these stems are just so long. It's like reading a bit of an essay, plus you're under pressure. So uh, you know, I do really encourage people to you know, practice these to time because they're just not that easy to get everything across and your answers aren't, aren't going to be perfect, obviously. So yeah, does anyone want to um, volunteer for this one? If I'm new to the auditorium for anyone in the auditorium that might want to. I 
can give it a go. Yeah, go for it. Unmuted. So um, this is a patient who needs perioperative risk assessment and um, for which I would be basically using some um, uh, the scoring systems, but prior to that, um, I would do a detailed history examination and investigation while involving a multidisciplinary team approach because he has quite a few um, comorbidities that needs to uh, be assessed in detail and um, keeping in mind that he has dementia and um, the medical power of attorney is with his son and that needs to be dealt with as in in terms of if he has any advanced health directive or um, yep, that sounds deep good. wishes and um, what scoring one, systems you mentioned? What's that? Well, what scoring systems were you thinking? Uh, so um, Nesquip is one of those, which is most oh, commonly gosh. used these days. Mm -hmm. um, P-Possum is more in um, regards or uh, with laparotomies that came into picture, but Nesquip is the one that comes to my mind that I would be using to guide my perioperative risk of the patient. Um, and also keeping in mind that this patient has sepsis and the procedure that he needs is probably um, urgent and um, is a, more a palliative procedure rather than a curated procedure. And um, that would be also on my mind while I'm assessing the patient in terms of perioperative risk for the patient. Yeah. As in you would clarify if it's palliative or do you assume it's palliative? I'm assuming, but yeah, since you've said it, probably I'll clarify it, but it's it's a debridement and that's the source of the infection is what I would be thinking. Yeah. yeah. Good, good. Um, and if you were to give me a statement of what his overall risk is, what would you say? It's a high risk, um, as in the overall risk of the patient is high, considering he has so many comorbidities. Okay, good, good. And so the way I kind of framed it is pretty similar, an overall general assessment history examination invest investigations and you mentioned multidisciplinary team because there's a complex patient I definitely want specialists in from you know reviewing all the medical notes contacting the specialists that know this patient and then you've added a protocol or scoring system which I do as well so you know it, to with this with this question sometimes when I've asked this if people just go down the scoring system I feel like that's not taking kind of the whole thing into account so I think it's a much safer way to do it is to really go general uh, assess this patient in completeness uh, the scoring systems do only take certain aspects out of out of a very comp complete and complex assessment. So I think it's far safer thing to do is to do the overall assessment plus mentioned scoring, scoring system. I would always at the end of it summary, make a summary of the case risk um, based on whatever factors as well. So, you know, obviously it's just asking you for uh, how would you assess the pair of risk and mobility and mortality, and it doesn't take much else to then just offer what you what your perception of the risk is. Um, so this, this is what I've said. I've used a combination of comprehensive, you know, history examination investigation, consult as GP or specialist, and maybe use a scoring tool as well. Even though the surgery is peripheral and relatively low risk, his peripheral risk is relatively high based on these factors. And I'd mention those things. So, you know, again, nothing in this STEM is that, um, you know, it happens by accident. So the fact that you're mentioning sepsis, the you know, age of the patient's urgent surgery, the patient has dementia, uh, clarify exercise tolerance, and maybe you need further information about the vital signs because maybe they are actually hypotensive and you know uh, deteriorating right in front of you, which you don't know because you haven't got that information. And obviously other markers uh, on investigation that might help you with perioperative morbidity and mortality, namely you know the bloods, HB, CRP, creatinine, albumin, maybe even a previous stress test or an echo as well. I just had, I just happened to put uh, some conservative numbers into the Nesquip uh, scoring system. And yeah, look, you know, death is less below average, but, but any complication, serious complication is in that kind of that 15% range. So yeah, you know, you, you could you could argue it, it is pretty high risk. I always feel like the, um, sorry, this is Lara again. I feel like uh -huh. the Nesquip score, just from my personal experience yeah. seems so, um, I feel under like it underestimates mortality yeah. and morbidity in terms of what <laughs> you think it would be. That, that is a thing. I mean, I think, I forget which paper was reviewing the scoring systems and they very specifically mentioned that Nesquip probably underestimates the mortality, morbidity mortality. And, and I'm not sure why, whether it's because they're in big centers in the US doing many, many of these operations with you know, advanced methods versus 
uh, you know, doing it in places that are much smaller and maybe Australia has a has, has smaller hospitals with less numbers, I'm not sure. Uh, but yeah, I, I'd, I'd agree with that point. There's yeah, definitely, definitely it's been mentioned. Uh, yeah, good. So th that was a taster of, you know, just interest stems and in the way I think about them just to make sure that I have a reproducible answer. I'm not too panicked at the time. Uh, I get that interest stem so I can, you know, just give a solid answer and try not to miss anything, especially adding those protocols, adding uh, that the unique situations that they've added in and mentioning those. I think, again, really important because nothing in that stem is by accident. So we won't do this, but essentially the exam will be full of difficult decisions. And I think, again, this is something that you want to practice in your practice virus all the time. But let's go through a couple now. So imagine you've got a 24 year old male with a penetrating eye injury. What's your induction plan? And assuming you have all relevant monitoring assistance and equipment. Um, yeah, so I might just ask, I, I actually just, just get a volunteer. So let's say 24 year old, penetrating eye injury, the, eye, the ophthalmologist need to operate quite urgently. What do you do for induction? Anyone can talk to me. Just, just for speed, I might just pick on people if that's all right. Um, next person along is Harry Bell. Hey, Leo. Hey, how you doing? Good, thank you. Um, so the question is, what's your induction plan? Yeah. Um, so the most important thing is to try and do something that's not going to increase your intraocular pressure. Mm -hmm. um, so from my point of view, my induction plan would be a rapid sequence induction using a 1.2 milligram per kilo dose of rocuronium and propofol. Yeah, fantastic. I, I, and I think, you know, the, the, the having the controversy of using sucks that could theoretically increase intraocular pressure. Look, there's, you know, there's no evidence of any harm that's happened from it. So if you did, if said sucks methonium, you might say, look, I, I understand there's theoretical risk of increasing intraocular pressure, but this is not born in any studies and I'd rather have a definitive endpoint. Whereas you know, using rock is completely fine as well. When I was going through the exam, this was probably a bit more of a contentious thing. I feel like people are far more you know, happy with whatever, whatever you're going to use. Um, yeah. So, you know, you, you can make these decisions more and more difficult based on, you know, the context. Uh, let's say you're at a small Metro hospital with four operating theaters on a morning list. Sorry. On a morning list, a 50 year old female with no past history, uh, is, is having a lap collie and is underway and it's 30 minutes in. So the surgeon's like operating right in there. You have an introductory training with two months anesthesia experience. The packing nurse runs in saying the last lap collie, it was a 35 year old female uh, with no passage, sats of 90% and is breathing funny. Um, so I might just, you know, just ask someone, uh, Naomi P, what would you, what would you do here? Um, so I would, uh, I would ensure that the patient that is on the table is stable. Uh, obviously, the patient in recovery needs urgent attention. So I'd ask the PACU nurses to initiate some kind of emergency met call or whatever kind of emergency buzzer they have there. Let's say you're the you you and your IT are the only people in the okay. in the hospital at this point. Oh, okay. Well, obviously an experienced um, doctor needs to attend the patient who is deteriorating in recovery. So um, you would have to ensure that the patient in the operating theatre is um, stable and that you can leave them with potentially an experienced um, uh, anaesthetic technician um, to be able to attend the emergency. Um, I guess, yeah, you just have to use the resources that you have available to you. Okay, so you're gonna you're gonna leave your patient and go to recovery, is that right? Um, yes, if my patient was stable and I had a, I had someone who could um, monitor the patient mm -hmm. and and let and notify me if there was any deteriorations, I would leave the patient. Yeah, okay, good. Um, how about if you would, how, how about if this uh, introductory trainee was actually a medical student? What would you do? Uh... And your anesthesia nurse is is a normal anesthesia nurse 
not not a grab, but just. I, I would I would do some temporising things then. Um, mm -hmm. I would probably stay with my patient in theatre, mm -hmm. and I would get the PACU nurses to I guess start some like probably prepare um, some emergency equipment um, in PACU. Mm -hmm. I would they you know we're essentially covering A B C D E. Um, mm -hmm. Make sure that they've got um, airway equipment ready in case the patient needs to be intubated. Mm -hmm. uh, I would make sure that they've got 100% oxygen on. Mm -hmm. uh, make let's, sure. say, let's say the patient sats, they, you've, you, they're on the phone, you've told them to do that. Now the patient sats fall down 80% bits uh, in spite of doing the maneuvers that you've asked them to do within their scope. Yeah, okay, sure. So in that case, I guess you, you've you got um, uh, two conflicting kind of um, situations. So I would probably tell the surgeons to just stop what they're doing. Mm -hmm. um, I think you just, unfortunately, you would have to make a choice um, in terms of which patient you're going to attend to. Mm -hmm. um, I would attend to the patient um, in recovery and make sure that there's someone in theatre that can, um, you know, let me know if there's if there's any deterioration in theatre and make sure that there's some kind of uh, staff on the way or call mm -hmm. the emergency department or mm -hmm. if there's ICU, just make sure that there's some medical staff that can come and assist you. And who would you choose in that theatre? to monitor this patient? Whoever the most senior clinician is, just to keep an eye on things. Yeah, sounds good. Hey, so <laughs> Naomi, I think you answered that really well. This is, I don't know if you've been asked this kind of question before. Uh, no, but I've, I guess I've maybe had to think about it, like in terms yeah. of you know, have a cat one sees, I get called when you're. Yeah, and, and probably the hardest part, part is actually answering this question in an exam, right? Because you've got a lot riding on the question. Whereas in real life, you kind of just do what you got to do for the sickest patient around. You know, it's like that, it's a triage type system. And I remember getting this kind of question wondering, oh, I have, you know, what is the right exam answer? And I honestly don't think there's a right exam answer, but that said, don't take my word for it. I want you to ask lots of consultants what they would do and get a good breadth of answers. Um, from, from my point of view, I remember when I, when I asked this question and heard people talking about it, they had you know, varying answers depending on what was going on. And it really depended on the urgency of the external problem as well as the problem in, in theater itself. And you can imagine a situation where both are very bad and you really can't save everyone. But let's, let's say it isn't that. I, I, I would say very, something very similar to you. Like I would instruct the nurses to do all the basic maneuvers, including applying oxygen and turning up oxygen and apply, applying airway maneuvers uh, as well while calling for help if there was any available. Let's say there isn't any help and they've done everything. I would go all the way to the point of uh, tell the surgeons to stop like you did. And if I've made the my assistants very, very junior, potentially I would ask the surgeons to uh, uh, essentially give the you know, metaraminol to the surgeons and say, hey, if, if the blood pressure goes below 100, why don't you give a mil, a mil of this and make sure that it goes in, but stop surgery, keep new perineum on and just pause while I sort this problem out and potentially even bring that patient from PACU into your anesthetic room if that's, if that's possible. So, you know, there's all these, all these ways you might be able to temporize it, but again, difficult decisions, you've got to, you know, you've got to really do something that's uncomfortable but I feel like this exam often does that and you just need a way of talking about it and getting to a point of an answer that sounds reasonable. Yeah, you did really well. Thank you. Uh, yeah, what if they're a medical student? How about if you had no one with you? Yeah, you'd you know, really just go every, to every point, finally with the surgeon being, you know, they are a specialist doctor. They are well within their abilities to look after a patient. Uh, okay, 60 year old male, otherwise well has a right lung lobectomy uh, for, uh, for, for a mass. And 30 minutes into the case, which is a thoracotomy, the blood pressure drops to 40, then 20, and you see the chest filling with blood. What do you do? I might just ask the next person long in. Sorry for just picking on people. Uh, Julia Rouse, what do you reckon? And if Julia's not around, you know what? I haven't asked the Melbourne Room Auditorium. Uh, does someone there want to um, give me an answer? Go for it. Can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear you. It sounds spooky, but I can hear you. 
it's, it's all the data, all the data and my name is Andre. So it's obviously a critical situation. Uh, patient is uh, in uh, currently cardiac, almost cardiac arrest situation. So the things that we do is number one is call for help, uh, hit the buzzer. Um, ask surgeons to stop uh, what they are doing currently, and uh, I would um, uh, quickly uh, uh, put patient 100% oxygen and start CPR. Okay, you do CPR and you've got the art line in, the blood pressure is what it is, the chest is filling up with blood, there's blood everywhere, what do you do? So obviously this patient requires um, ongoing CPR with um, um, fluid resuscitation. Uh, so basically I would give him as much um, a fluid bolus and obviously we need a blood, um, but also it's very important to stop the bleeding and assess where the patient um, bleeds from. So I would um, ask surgeons uh, to get the most experienced surgeons to come in theater as soon as possible. So we need to find the source of bleeding and stop it. Okay. And, and I so guess it is the definitive management. Okay, so you're doing CPR, you're getting fluid in. Let's say the surgeons are very experienced and there's two of them in theater with you. Uh, ha, ha, so do, do you stop CPR for them to try to sort it out or what do you do? Uh, I would continue CPR uh, and would, I, would, I would accept the risk of more difficult, uh, more difficult situation for surgeons to find their um, uh, bleeding, but um, I, would, uh, I would continue CPR and I would probably ask, if, if it takes time, I would probably ask them to think about like a ligation of the um, um, artery supply and lung to stop the bleeding. The surgeons tell you that it is impossible for them to ligate the artery while you're doing CPR? What do you do? Um, I would uh, continue CPR. Mm -hmm. I would uh, get, um, I would initiate massive transfusion protocol. Mm -hmm. um, I would get more people to help and I would... Uh, what, what would those people help do? So obviously it's massive transfusion protocol, so we need a lot of people. We need to get the bloods checked. We need the uh, cross match if it hasn't been done yet. We need oh. to start. So that's fine. Hey, so now this is obviously a really uncomfortable situation, right? So I've, I've given you this horrendous problem, right? Where the problem that you need to solve can't be solved by doing the intervention that you've been told to do for the last 10, 20 years of your life. Patient has an arrest, you do CPR, and hopefully they come back. But unfortunately, when you do CPR on the chest and the problem is a vessel that's been you know, blown, how on earth are you going to solve that problem? How do, you, how do you feel about that? I feel bad. Uh, I think yeah. there, there are a few options. Like if it's impossible to like get it, so probably another option would be try to think about embolization, although it's going to be very, I guess, difficult and probably impossible in this situation. So another option would be uh, to think about some sort of um, put the clip uh, on the artery or just apply direct pressure. Um, I ask the surgeons to put their hand over there and just to push it against uh, the bony prominence to stop it somehow yeah. and try to stabilize patient. Okay, so my, my again, don't take my word for this. This is purely my opinion. Uh, this is one of those times where if the surgeon needs to do something, often you have to do the wrong thing for them to fix the problem. For, and this is, this is just a very extreme example of, say you have a you know, subarachnoid bleed and you know you get, you get a rebleed in the operation and the surgeon says you need to drop the pressure i need to fix this and then you drop the pressure to 60 so they get a clear you know clear view this is not too dissimilar to that you've got a patient who's essentially volume underloaded let's say they're in pulseless electrical activity not so specifically not vf because you'd have to you know shock them back into the rhythm and really your problem is having no volume and this so you've got to fill them up and the problem is that you've got uh, you know, a vessel that's completely open and the surgeons cannot fix it with a clip. So I'd, I'd say this is one of the situations where you have to say, look, this is, this is a very difficult problem. And I know that normal protocol is to do chest compressions in, in this procedure, but I don't think that's gonna solve the problem. The patient will die. They need, the, they need this to be fixed. Um, I, so I would accept a temporary period of not doing CPR while volume, catching up with volume resus while the surgeons try to fix and plug that lesion. And so I would approach it very cautiously in that manner, 
because I know this is you know, a really difficult situation. I, I probably wouldn't mention things like embolization because again, doing CPR, getting them into the, you know, down to radiology when you've got surgeons with an open chest ready, to, that, that seems far more unrealistic than stopping CPR for you know, up to a minute even. Um, so again, difficult decision, totally outside protocol. Um, and again, um, you know, see, see, what you, see what you can come up with to brainstorm this by talking to your colleagues and see what they do, see what the spectrum of opinion for this is. Um, I've just got a couple of comments. I have zero cardiothoracic experience, but is there a role for adenosine in a situation like this to allow surgeons to get a better view of the bleeding vessel like in neuro? Yeah, look, I, I think anything's on the table with this. This is so uncommon and so horrendous that if it, whatever the surgeons need to quickly fix something, I would argue that that is what you need to do. You know, there's a few times where you do exactly what the surgeons tell you to do, and that's in cardiothoracics, and that's in neurosurge. Um, yeah, so, the, you know, this, this patient, CPI is not going to fix the problem if their heart is still in, you know, EM, you know, electrical activity because of volume loss. You need to replace volume plus, you know, do that, right? you know, do, fix, the, fix the problem itself. Yeah. Again, completely... Just my opinions about this. I don't think it's, it may be seen as controversial, but I think this exam definitely goes down to some very difficult decision issues and have a chat about them before you learn how to talk around this, uh, but also get to an answer. Any questions about that? I think this is mentioned Oxford Handbook of Anesthesia, fifth edition. Oh, great, thanks, Greg. Um, hey, if, if you do have a photo, if you can um, take a screenshot or a photo of that Oxford Handbook page and send it to me, that'd be really, that'd be really great. Um, so, so that's all I've got time to talk about. Um, again, boot camps here, we, we run through just lots and lots of drills on this kind of stuff, assessments, priorities, difficult decisions, intro stems, crisis management, all that kind of stuff and CRM as well. Um, and thanks very much for your time. I hope you enjoyed it and good luck for your exam. Amazing, thank you. Does anyone have any last questions at all? Just lots of thank yous coming nice. through. Thanks for organizing, Kathy. Very appreciate it. Our pleasure, no, thank you. Yeah. Thanks for still being dedicated, even though you're across the other side of, of uh, I was gonna uh, say the world, not the world, Australia. <laughs> it, is, it is the other side of the world. <laughs> <laughs> it is at the moment when it comes to the, um, the, the temperatures. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But no, awesome, thank you. Cool. Thanks guys, bye-bye. Have a good night, see you later. Bye. If you've got any um, suggestions.